I had never seen a dead body before until I was 16 years old and I found myself face to face staring into the corpse of one of my friends. He had died after a night of partying in a tragic car accident. And here at the age of 16, I found myself in a funeral home, lined up in front of the casket, waiting for my turn to view the body of my friend. It was an open casket. He was Catholic, and so they had a, a, a tradition then where uh, you would kneel in front of the casket. And so you would kneel and I suppose pray there for the individual as a Catholic believer. And so as I was waiting my turn, I thought, there he is, that, that's his body, but it doesn't look like him, but it does look like him. And what am I gonna do when I get there? And finally it was my turn and I walked up to the casket and I knelt and here I was, my face and his face about two feet away and I was staring into this corpse, this empty shell. And at that moment, my mind was filled with questions. In fact, as I knelt at that casket, I began to ponder questions at a whole new level. And I began to ponder the question that many of you people are pondering through our You Asked For It series this year. I began to ponder the question, so what happens after we die? What is life after death look like? As I look back on my life, I now realize that when I stood up and walked away from that casket, I was taking the first steps in a lifelong quest. I was taking the first steps in a lifelong journey, a journey of seeking, seeking the answers to the questions of life, death, and eternity. Over the next few moments, I'm gonna do my best to share with you what I've learned on that journey. What happens after we die? What does life after death look like? So we're gonna begin at the beginning. And by that I mean, we're gonna begin with a, a foundational question. It's on your outlines today. What does it mean to be human? An odd question I realize, but think with me for a moment. What does it mean to be human? Well, as your outline says, a human being is uniquely created in the image of God. The Bible says in Genesis 1, God created mankind in his own image. In the image of God, he created them. Male and female, he created them. That means as a human being, you are unlike any other creature in the universe. As a human being, you have intrinsic value. Just by being a human, you are more valuable than any other creature on earth or in the universe. That doesn't mean other creatures don't have value, but you have a higher value just by being a human. Why? Because you as a human being are uniquely created in the image of God. Well, what is it about us that reflects the image of God? Well, it cannot be our physical bodies because the Bible's clear that God is not a physical being. The Bible says that God is spirit. So, so that means that our, our physical bodies don't reflect his image. It's not, like we, it's not as though we look like God because God doesn't have a body. So then what is it about us that uniquely reflects the image of God? Well, there's more to being human than having a physical body. You are more than your muscles and membranes, your blood and your bones. In fact, as your outline says, a human is a body-soul composition. As a human being, you are a body-soul composition, okay? Meaning a body and a soul that are, are work together, a body and a soul that combine together into one being. Now, the writer of the very first book of the Bible, Genesis, he poetically described this body-soul dynamic when he depicted the creation of the first human being. Listen to what he wrote in Genesis chapter 2. It says, then the Lord God formed a man from the dust of the ground. So there's the physical aspect. The Lord God formed the man from the dust of the ground, and he breathed into his nostrils the breath of life. And the man became a living being. Now, this was originally written in Hebrew. And that phrase, living being, is literally the Hebrew word for soul. So God breathed into this dust, this physical entity, the breath of life, and that man became a living soul. So there you see the body and the soul combining together to make a human being. 
Now, we are very familiar with the body, but what exactly is a soul? Now, the simplest way I can think to explain this is the soul is the part of you that's not physical. The soul is the part of you that's not physical. A couple of years ago, we did a series on the whole uh, nature and care of the soul that we called SOS. And in that series, we likened the soul to a piece of furniture. In that series, we likened the soul to a dresser, you know, where, where you put your clothing with all these drawers and you put your clothing in this dresser drawer. Well, we likened the soul to a dresser with four drawers with each drawer representing a different capacity uh, that our soul possesses. For example, the top drawer would represent the will. That's the home of your power to choose. The second drawer is the intellect. That's the home of the mind and the thoughts and your, your self-awareness, your reasoning, your beliefs. The third drawer is the emotions. That's the home of our feelings and our emotive responses. And the fourth drawer is the spirit. That, that's our home, the home of our ability to interact with God in the spiritual realm. So you have one drawer, or I'm sorry, one dresser, but four drawers. One soul, but four distinct qualities, four distinct capacities within that one soul. Okay, so then what does it mean to be human? A human is a being that's uniquely created in the image of God made up of a body-soul composition. So a human is a soul that lives in and through a body. You say, okay, so what does that have to do with anything? Darren, why did we need to start with that? How does that information answer today's question about life after death? Well, we started with that because when we ask what happens when we die, we're asking what happens when this body-soul composite ceases to function. Well, we know what happens to our body. That's why we have caskets and urns and funeral directors. So what we're really asking is, what happens to our soul? If you believe the Bible, when we die, our soul is temporarily separated from our body. As, as your outline says, when we die, our soul is temporarily separated from our body. Now, why temporarily? Hold on, we'll get to that in a moment. Just be patient, just hold on. Now, once again, we look to the very first book of the Bible, the book of Genesis, for valuable pieces of information on this topic. Jacob and Rachel had a deep love for one another. Together, they had many children. In fact, their children became the foundation for the nation of Israel. Now, Genesis 35 describes something tragic. It describes the death of Rachel. She died while giving birth to their son, Benjamin. I'm going to read from the New American Standard Bible. It's a version of the Bible that it's a translation that's more literal uh, in its translation of the original Hebrew. Genesis 35, starting at verse 16, says this. It says, Rachel began to give birth, and she suffered severe labor. When she was in severe labor, the midwife said to her, Do not fear, for now you have another son. She's saying, You've done it. You've delivered this son. Now look what it says next. It came about as her soul was departing, for she died it came about that she named him, so the last thing she does before she dies, she named him Ben-Oni, but his father named him Benjamin. Just as an aside, so what's happening here is, is Rachel in her pain, the last moments of her life, out of her pain, she names the child son of my trouble. And Jacob, he says, no, we're not going to saddle this young child with that name the rest of his life. We're going to call him son of my right hand, meaning son of influence or son of power. Now, notice how the biblical writer describes the experience of death. Rachel's death was depicted as her soul departing from her body. The soul is the part of you that's not physical. And the soul is the part of you that will survive death. Rachel's body ceased to function, but her soul survived. Her soul departed from her body. Now, what happened to Rachel is what happens to every person that dies. 
when we die, our soul is temporarily separated from our body. Okay, so where does our soul go? Well, let me first tell you from a biblical perspective where our soul does not go. If you've ever watched a horror movie or seen shows on uh, television where they're, they're traveling through homes and old places or graveyards with special cameras and so on, and they're trying to study the paranormal, and they're talking about haunted houses, and they claim there are ghosts roaming around, and, and decades ago or hundreds of years ago, little Johnny died here in this room, and we believe that his ghost still lingers and wanders around and moves rocking chairs and curtains and so on. This whole idea of ghosts and haunting, you need to know that, biblically speaking, that's a bunch of garbage. Biblically speaking, your soul does not hang around in the world afterwards. Listen, when we die, our soul is temporarily separated from our bodies. Where does it go? Well, you can be sure of this. Our soul does not wander the earth, moping around, all sad, popping in on unsuspecting friends and family. That's not what happens according to scripture. So where exactly does our soul go? Well, that brings us to today's big idea. Yeah, today's big idea is much earlier in the sermon. Here's today's big idea. Where does your soul go when you die? You reach in death what you pursued in life. I'm going to say that again. You reach in death what you pursued in life. It's been my experience over the decades that today's big idea is going to come as a shock to some people. I've been to more than my fair share of funerals, and I've heard more than my fair share of conversations around caskets. And the expectation that many people seem to have is that death is not a continuation of what happens during a person's life. No, the expectation that many people seem to have is that death is some kind of supernatural instant change room. What do I mean? When I was a kid, I used to watch Superman on television. And Superman, you know, to the rest of the world, he was just mild-mannered Clark Kent, a, a news reporter. But every now and then, when there was a crisis, Clark Kent would walk into a phone booth. He would go into the phone booth as mild-mannered Clark Kent, and then he would emerge from that phone booth as Superman, a completely different person. Some people seem to think of death as something similar to Superman's phone booth. They seem to think that there is something about the experience of dying that radically transforms us into a completely different person. They seem to think that the person we are before we die has nothing to do with the person we are after we die. Now listen, while it is true that death does bring about certain changes in our lives, death does not change the direction of our lives. You reach in death what you pursued in life. Death is simply a continuation of where you were already heading in life. Death is the experience of finally and fully taking hold of what you have been pursuing all of your life. You reach in death what you pursued in life. Now, it should be noted that God is actively trying to influence what you pursue in life. Biblically speaking, left on our own, none of us would pursue God. Did you know the Bible says that? In the book of Romans, chapter 3, verse 11, it says, There is no one who seeks God. Nobody who understands. No one who seeks God. See, here's the sad reality of human existence. Yes, we were made in the image of God, but we walked away from God. We turned our backs on God. We rejected God. Now, we're still made in His image, but that image has been marred. It's been damaged. And part of the marring, part of the damage, is that our hearts, our soul, has become hardened by sin. So that we do not pursue God. Left on our own, we would not pursue God. We would not chase after God. We would not desire God. So what does God do? He pursues us. 
The Spirit of God pursues us since you were born. The Spirit of God has been pursuing you, placing you in circumstances, using the circumstances of your life to speak to you, to draw you, to soften your heart, to, 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 to direct your heart and your thoughts towards Him. And so you can either welcome the work of God's Spirit in your life or you can resist the work of God's Spirit in your life. Now, if we welcome the work of God's Spirit, if we don't resist Him, He imparts to us a hunger and a desire for His presence to the degree that we actually do begin to pursue Him. And when we do that, when we begin to pursue Him, He points us to Jesus. So pursuers of God become followers of Christ. Now, God does this. God points us to Jesus because it's through Jesus that God has revealed himself to humanity and it's through Jesus that God has rescued humanity. The Bible puts it this way. In fact, Jesus himself said this. I'm quoting Jesus now from John chapter 14. Jesus said, I am the way. I am the truth. I am the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Did you hear that statement? Jesus said, I am the way. I am the truth. I am the life. In fact, no one can experience God the Father unless you come through me. I am the gate. I am the doorway to God the Father. No one comes to the Father except through me. Jesus himself again in John chapter 3 is quoted saying, For God, meaning the Father, God the Father so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son, speaking of himself, that whoever believes in him, in me, Jesus was saying, will not perish, but will have eternal life. Again, no one comes to the Father except through me. And, and the Father has given me as a sacrifice. I am willingly come as a sacrifice to pay the moral debt of humanity. And if you'll believe in me, if you'll accept my gift, if you'll accept the sacrifice that I've made on your behalf, paying your moral debt, then you will not perish. You will not be eternally separated from the Father, but you instead will have eternal life. That's the good news, what's called the gospel, that Jesus came to forgive you and cleanse you. Have you responded to that good news? Are you resisting the Spirit of God? If you've not yet responded, at the end of today's message, I'm going to give you an opportunity to do that very thing. Listen, the Spirit of God points us to Jesus because it is through Jesus that God has revealed himself to humanity and it's through Jesus that God has rescued humanity. You are watching me right now and you're either welcoming or you're resisting the Spirit of God in your life. So realize this, what you are pursuing today is what you will experience for eternity. Your soul will reach in death what your soul pursues in life. As your outline says, if you welcomed the spirit and presence of God in life, your soul experienced the eternal presence of God in death. If you welcomed the spirit and presence of God in life, your soul will experience the eternal presence of God in death. In a letter written about 2,000 years ago, a man named Paul taught that when the soul of a Christ follower is temporarily away from the body, it is at home with the Lord. Paul said that. In another letter, Paul answered Christ followers and who were wondering about all this, and he said, listen, I assure you that you will be with the Lord forever. So understand this. If you've had a friend or a family or a loved one who was a follower of Jesus and they've died. What's happened to them? Their soul temporarily was separated from their body and their soul went to be in the presence of the Lord. To be absent from the body, Paul said, is to be present with the Lord. And they will forever be with the Lord. So right now, your friend, your loved one who's a follower of Jesus, if they've died, you can be assured that right now their soul is somehow in the presence of God enjoying and interacting with the presence of God. You reach in death what you pursued in life. If you welcome the spirit and presence of God in your life, your soul will experience the eternal presence of God in death. However, as your outline says, if you rejected the spirit and presence of God in life, your soul will experience eternal separation from God 
in death. If you rejected his presence in life, then your soul will experience eternal separation from God in death. A man named John, who was given a vision of what will happen in the future, he wrote this in the last book of the Bible, Revelation in chapter 20. I'm just going to start reading at verse 11. He's depicting what will happen to those who choose separation. He says, Then I saw a great white throne, and him who was seated on it. The earth and the heavens fled from his presence, and there was no place for them. And I saw the dead, great and small, standing before the throne, and the books were opened. Another book was opened, which is the book of life. The dead were judged according to what they had done as recorded in the books. And the sea gave up the dead that were in it, and death and Hades, which is hell, gave up the dead that were in them. And each person was judged according to what they had done. And then death and Hades were thrown into the lake of fire. The lake of fire is the second death. And anyone whose name was not found written in the book of life was thrown into the lake of fire. You get your name in the book of life by accepting the gift that Jesus had given to you, the gift of forgiveness and eternal life. If you didn't pursue the presence of God during your life, God's not going to impose himself upon you in your death. God gives you what you desired. You reach in death what you pursued in life. For those who who chose to reject the work of God's Spirit in their life, their eternal separation, it's quite sobering as we've just read. But what about those who welcome the presence of God in their lives? What does eternal life look like for those who follow Jesus? Well, immediately after describing the eternal fate of those who rejected God's presence, the writer of Revelation describes the fate of those who welcome God's presence. It's literally the very next verse that begins. Revelation chapter 21, reading at, starting at verse 1. And then I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and there was no longer any sea. Sea was symbolic in apocalyptic literature for the mass and chaos of humanity. There was no longer any sea. And I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared like a bride, beautifully dressed for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Look, God's dwelling place is now among the people, and he will dwell with them. They will be his people, and God himself will be with them and be their God. He will wipe away every tear from their eyes. There will be no more death or mourning or crying or pain, for the old order of things has passed away. And then he who was seated on the throne said, I'm making everything new. And then he said, write this down, for these words are trustworthy and true. And he said to me, it's done. It's done. I am the Alpha and the Omega. That's the first and last letters in the Greek alphabet. It's like he's saying, I'm the A and the Z. I'm the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. To the thirsty, I will give water without cost and the spring of the water of life. Those who are victorious will inherit all this and I will be their God and they will be my children. What does eternal life look like for those who follow Jesus? As your outline says, you will will live a productive, eternal existence in a new heaven on a new earth. So you're going to have this productive new existence in a brand new heaven on a brand new earth. God's going to recreate the universe and recreate the the earth in some unique way. So you're thinking, so how am I going to experience this? Will I be floating around as a disembodied spirit for all of eternity? No, not at all. And this is where we finally answer the question of temporarily separated from the body. See, remember what we learned at the beginning today. We learned that part of what it means to be human is to have a body. So the answer is no. You will not spend eternity floating around as some disembodied soul. As your outline says, your soul will be given a new, improved, eternal body. Your soul, which has been disembodied in death, will then be given a new, improved, eternal body. 
In a letter he wrote to the church in ancient city of Corinth, the Apostle Paul, he went into some detail regarding the kind of body that Christ follower will have in eternity. You can read all about it in 1 Corinthians chapter 15. But he says it'll be a glorious body, meaning just bright, shining, perfected. He said it'll be immortal, imperishable, powerful. It'll be Holy Spirit infused. Stories told of a, a gentleman who is driving out in the countryside, way out in these rolling hills at night, and his car breaks down. And there's nothing he can do to fix it. He doesn't have a cell phone. So he walks along and he sees a big house on a hill. So he walks up to the house on the hill. He knocks on the door. Turns out he's at a monastery full of all these monks. And he says, I'm sorry, my car has broken down just a, a couple hundred yards down the road. Can you help? And these monks were very helpful. They said, yes. And they... they dragged his car, they pulled his car up into their monastery where they had a little garage and these monks, a couple of them were mechanics and, and they're fixing his car and while they're fixing his car, he's sitting in one of the rooms in the monastery and he hears this noise, this mysterious sound, this incredibly just alluring sound behind this door and he, he finally asked them, he says, what is this sound? And they said, I'm sorry, we cannot tell you what that sound is. We can't tell you the source of that sound because you're not a monk. He says, oh man, I really would love to know the source of the sound. I'm sorry, we can't tell you. You're not a monk, but here's the keys to your car. We fixed it. It's our gift to you. He drives away and for weeks, for months, he can't get this sound out of his mind. So he returns back to the monastery and he says, listen, you really need to tell me. I'm just captivated by that sound. What is the source of that sound? We can't tell you. You're not a monk. Well, I want to become a monk. What do I have to do to become a monk? They said, well, to become a monk, you have to do two things. You've got to shave your head and count the number of hairs on your head. And then you have to travel to the Holy Land and you have to count the number of pebbles along the entire shoreline of the Sea of Galilee. He says, I'll do it. And he did it. He shaved his head. He counted the number of hairs on his head. And he traveled to the Holy Land. And he spent months, years, counting the number of pebbles on the shore all around the Sea of Galilee. And finally, he went back to that monastery, knocked on the door. He said, I had 23,347 hairs on my head. And there were 28,389,476 pebbles along the shores of the Sea of Galilee. And they said, well done. You are now a monk. Welcome. And he said, so what's the source of that sound? And they said, here's the key to the mystical door behind which you'll find the source of that sound. So he opens the first big wooden door and then there's another large uh, door made out of ruby and he turns the key and he opens the ruby door and there's another door of jasper and he turns the key and he opens the door of jasper and there's another door made of, of a giant pearl and he turns the key and he opens the pearl door and he sees a door made out of gold and he turns the key and he opens the door of gold and there he sees it. He sees the source of this mysterious sound that had, had, had so enchanted him and the source of that sound was something that I can't tell you because you're not a monk. Life is full of mysteries. Life after death has a level of mystery to it. There's no doubt about that. There is much that we don't know. Having said that, it isn't as mysterious as some people seem to think. The truth is, when it comes to life after death, you reach in death what you pursued in life. Meaning, if you're a follower of Jesus, you can be assured that you will enjoy the presence of God forever. In a brand new supernatural world, in a brand new supernatural body. However, if you are not following Christ today, if you're choosing to resist the work of God's Spirit in your life, you can expect to experience what the biblical writer referred to as the second death. If you're choosing to resist the work of God's Spirit in your life, you can expect to spend eternity in a state of separation from God. But why? Why would anyone ever choose that fate? Why are you choosing that fate? As we conclude today, hear me. I am begging you to reconsider. I am begging you to stop resisting the Spirit of God. 
and to begin accepting and receiving the grace and the mercy and the love and the power and the forgiveness and the cleansing of God. Think about it. You can actually change your eternal destiny. And if you're wanting to do that, if you're willing to do that, I'm going to give you the opportunity to do that right now. Let's pray together as we conclude. Whoever you are, wherever you are right now, you're resisting the Spirit of God. He's offering you this free gift of cleansing and eternal life. And up till now, you have been working against His Spirit. But now you've decided, no, I'm no longer going to fight against you, God. I want to achieve and experience in, in death what I will now pursue in life. I am accepting the work that Jesus has done on my behalf. I acknowledge that I am rebellious. I acknowledge that I'm a sinner. I acknowledge that I've turned my back on you. And I'm responding to your spirit who has been drawing me. I accept your gift of cleansing and forgiveness. Fill me with your spirit afresh. Put new desires, new thoughts in my heart and in my mind. Help me to follow you from this moment forward. And give me the courage to actually act on this and tell somebody about this decision. Even before my head hits the pillow tonight, in Jesus' name I pray, amen. If you made that decision, you can act on it right now. There's a number on the screen. Text that number and someone will respond to you and help you take the next steps in your journey towards Christ-likeness, in your journey towards the presence of God. We want to help you. Don't worry, you're not joining Broadway Church. We're not going to trick you in any way. We just want to help you take the next step in your journey. Now, I realize that perhaps I've uh, said some things today that may have caused some questions and so on and stirred all sorts of questions and issues. Let me remind you that I will do a live question and answer time today at 1.15 p.m. Pacific time. Simply go to bway.ca slash ask Join me there at 115, and you and I can interact together, and I'll do my best to answer your questions. God bless you. Thank you for being at Broadway Church today.